So we'll start with jumping and running base tests. And the reason to start with these is they are the easiest tests to, to apply and they very much fit that notion of being very, very field based. So for example, if you're working in a team situation, you've got a lot of athletes to test, it is much easier to do jumping based tests than it is to do cycle based tests because the equipment that you use is far more portable and easy to, to use. So we're going to start with the classic test that exists in this domain, which is a single standing vertical jump. Now originally, that was proposed by Sargent back in 1924, and then there have been reiterations of that in 62, Rennie in 68, Offenbacher in 1970, and then Davies and, 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 and Comey. And it hasn't really changed considerably from that original idea for, from Sargent, which is, as you can see here, the participant does a single maximal vertical jump. And in essence, what you are measuring is the displacement of the center of mass. So the, the proxy indicator in this case of power is the height that the participant jumps. So it's considered a, a general measure of muscular power. But the thing to recognize straight away is go back to, to the previous session where we were referring to the power of the energy. And in that we were referring to millimoles per kilogram, this is in terms of ATP, millimoles per kilogram per second. And this is a really important point. In order for us to assess power, it is the, it's the amount of work done over time. With a vertical jump, we don't have, using this kind of approach that you see here, certainly, you don't have a measure of time. You quite simply have the height of the jump. So the question you have to ask yourself is, is this actually a measure of power? If all I simply measure is how high somebody jumps, it doesn't tell me how quickly they performed that activity. And remember that what we're trying to understand is how rapidly we can release the energy, how rapidly we get the ATP turnover rate anaerobically. Now, where this is quite interesting is that as I'll show you, the, the data suggests that there is, a, there is a, a correlation, a correlation between the height of a jump and the amount of power that is being produced. But one of the things I want you to take away is that correlations can be highly spurious. Don't be fooled into thinking just because two parameters are correlated, that is meaningful. You can find correlations between anything and anything. So a correlation merely shows an association. So there is a website which is the, called the website of spurious correlations and in there they will show you, for example, that the murder rate in New York City has a correlation of almost one. So it's almost a perfect correlation with the amount of apple pie being eaten. Two completely nonsense variables. I mean, does it, do you really think that the, the murder rate is a function of the amount of apple pies eaten? It doesn't make sense, but that's the problem with correlations. So although jump height is correlated to, to measures of power, when they've measured power, don't be fooled into necessary thinking that just jumping high is a proxy indicator of power. It seems to be, as I've put here, a, a dimension of work. It's almost really, isn't it, about kind of how strong somebody is because you're not measuring time. It's got that dimensionless component. One of the things that we know is that the choice of protocol has an enormous effect on the outcome of the results here. So in this example here, they're using um, a device where as you jump, all you do is you knock the, 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 the rack around and, 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 and they measure that, that height. So it's, it's, it's a fairly simple protocol. It's an evolution from what Sargent did, where in a Sargent jump, you'd ask somebody to stand with their arm raised, they're marked with a piece of chalk on the wall, they would then jump, and as they jumped, they would tap the wall with, with chalk dust on their fingers, and the difference between the two was the displacement to the center of mass. We now use slightly more modern techniques where we use jump belts or we even use jump mats. But in both of those situations, one of we've also changed the, the device that we're using, but we still have this issue that it, it doesn't measure power directly. But as you'll see, there's an awful lot of variability in the, in the kind of device that you use. But also there is variability which is associated with the way in which you ask the participant to do the jump.
clearly, if we do a standard, a, a vertical jump, what we tend to do is we tend to talk about it being either counter movement or non counter movement. So in a counter movement, what you'll do is you'll ask the participant to go from a standing position into a squatting position and then drive up from the squatting position. So that is using a counter movement. In a non counter movement, there is no squat. It is in essence a, a slight knee bend and then a vertical jump. Two completely different heights will be attained. So which is actually the closer measure of, of power? The second thing to then think about is that depend upon how far somebody goes down in that, say, that um, counter movement action will de determine how high they jump. Because the degree to which you go into the counter movement dictates the amount of cross bridge interaction that you get between the actin and the myosin filaments and therefore dictates how much force you can generate to, to, to get off the ground. Therefore it affects jump height. So there's variability there. Then the other thing to think about is that in a vertical jump, the displacement of the center of mass is also affected by the idea of whether we do or do not use an arm swing. Because one of the key things to recognize is that typically what we'll do is the participant will want to use the arm swing because it's that notion of driving up in the jump. But what we understand, and I'll show you some lovely data on this, is that by applying an arm swing, it makes the result highly variable. Because the thing that you don't have control of is, is how much do they swing the arms. And of course, how much they swing the arms will affect how much they get vertical displacement. But as you're about to see, it also affects how much horizontal displacement we get as well. Because by doing the arm swing, actually what tends to happen is people lean into the jump and they move horizontally rather than necessarily vertically. So do we then ask the participants to jump with the hands on the hips? And by jumping with the hands on the hips, that obviously is going to reduce the jump height. If it reduces the jump height, it therefore suggests that they've got a participant who's less, less powerful. But it is probably more consistent in terms of what we actually undertake. So when we look at the coefficient of variation, now the coefficient of variation is a very simple measure. This is just about how much variability there is in the data. So if you take an individual and you ask the individual to do X number of jumps, what you're looking for is, is a low degree of variability. And the coefficient of variation is quite simply calculated as the standard deviation divided by the mean times 100. So it's a percentage. So what they're saying here is actually they're getting coefficients of variation of less than 1%. So the argument that the authors are making here is actually this is, this is highly, um, um, it's, it's highly reliable on an individual basis. I would beg to differ, and I think you have to be very cautious of some of this data, and I'll show you why in a moment in terms of some of the, the data we've got. But let's have a look at these. These are two examples of individuals doing vertical jumps, and what I want you to focus on is what's happening. So in both of these, they're using a jump meter. So what we've got is we've got a jump mat that they're standing on. So if you look at the chap on the, on the, the left in his bright orange trainers, you can see quite clearly there's a circular disc on the ground. What is connected from the disc to um, a little belt, and you can see that belt just sitting around his waist, you can just see the red device at the front, is the jump meter. Connecting the mat to the jump meter is a cord. The cord is pulled tight. As he then goes through the, the counter movement and then takes off, the cord pulls out the device, and that measures the displacement of the center of mass. So let's, wa let's watch this in, in, in action. So we've got this in slow motion, you can see. Now in this example here, we've got an arm swing. So look at the effect of the arm swing. So we go into the counter movement. We accelerate up. We get a lovely jump. And that's really nice. Now the issue that you've got to think about is, would he be able to repeat that with the same count of movement and the same arm swing? Remembering that what you're trying to estimate here is the ATP turnover rate from anaerobic sources. Let's have a look at example two. So in this example again, 
arm swing. Good takeoff. But notice what happened in that example. Let's play that again. And we'll watch what happens in that example. So if we go again. So arm swing, vertical jump. But notice now what you're getting is, is you're getting horizontal displacement. And in fact, his form is all over the place because of this arm swing. So it's affecting the vertical displacement. So the cord is being pulled in a, in a different direction to that which we actually wanted. Whoops, let's go back through these again. Okay, so let's have a look at these examples here. So same thing, you can see the, the, the device, got an arm swing, we're getting the acceleration, but notice in this one the arm swing stopped so the arm swing wasn't what we would think of as a normal arm swing. It suddenly just stopped. And the whole thing is, it's about variability. Remember that whatever you do with the arm swing is going to affect the degree to which you attain vertical displacement, as will the counter movement. And what you are after is reliable results. Fundamentally, what you cannot do is just take a single measurement. Because a single measurement doesn't reflect potentially what's going on biologically. Somebody may not have, have mastered doing the jump. Somebody may not have, um, um, may do a poor jump on the first one. So we do more than one jump. We tend to take three and then we tend to take an average. But we can only take an average if the variability in those jumps is, is low. And in all of these, you're kind of seeing high degrees of individual variability. So again, let's have a look at this one. Arm swing. Good height thing attained, and a fairly good landing. So we can see that again, it's attainable with an arm swing. Would have been good to see in that example. Maybe would have been using it without a, an arm swing as, as well. So we can see that the arm swing has an effect. Now, one of the issues that we we talked about is the fact that none of those protocols measure power. Now, actually, this is a fundamental point to make across the whole of this this session to measure power from anaerobic sources is fundamentally at the moment impossible think about what you're what we're what we're ref referring to I, I in the previous session I spoke and you can go back to it about the notion which was which came from the um, the paper that was in nature they talked about the fact that the ATP turnover rate is occurring in a matter of milliseconds. Remember that you are, in essence, splitting ATP through water in the presence of ATPA to generate energy. That is not a slow process. You need that energy instantaneously. Currently, we have no way of analysing or recording that in real time. We can record cardiorespiratory responses very simply and we rec can record some metabolic responses for example things like lactate but measuring the power the rate at which that ATP is being used anaerobically is at the moment impossible for us to do that's a global global issue so this is why what we have are, are these protocols which are in essence non-invasive estimations of power they're not directly measuring it the mechanical measures to estimate metabolic power. So it's, it's using a, a mechanical test, like a jump or a cycle test, to estimate something that is going on, in essence, within the cell. And as we've already referred to with a, with a vertical jump, the problem that you've got is that a vertical jump <laughs> doesn't measure power. It, it estimates it, and it's estimating it by the jump height. So what a number of authors have done is they've tried to, to, to put a power calculation into this. Now, what you've got to remember is these are real estimates because the one thing that they are not taking into account at all is the rate. So these are kind of estimating this. So if you take the Sayers formula, for example, it's PAP, which is peak anaerobic power, and this is measured in, in, in watts. So it's got a constant, which is 60.7. It's multiplied by the jump height plus another constant, which is 45.3, times body mass, 
minus another constant, which is 20.55. So the way they've done these, you know, and kudos to the authors for doing these, is what they've done is they've done lots and lots and lots of vertical jumps with different people. And they've looked using those and comparing those to standard measures and so more conventional measures of power. So they're still comparing an estimate to an estimate. So, for example, they compared a vertical jump to a, a cycle-based test. They had a, a, more, a more direct estimate of power on the jump on the cycle test. And then from that, they can calculate these, these, these formulas. These, in essence, are a y equals mx plus c formula, which is an association between two parameters. The same, the same with Johnson and, and bar mode. Slightly different in terms of the, cal the numbers, but the principle is pretty much the same. And the same with Harmon. So all of these are estimates. They're not direct measures. And each of these in, its, in itself comes with issues in terms of how reliable is it? Is it, a, you know, um, it's fundamentally affected by the reliability of the jump. But then how valid is it to take an estimate of power where you've not recorded anything which is time-based? Notice not one of these has a time-based index within them. That notwithstanding, if we look at this, which is is um, um, quite a nice, quite a nice um, summary, and it states this: the validity of these formula are questionable. It is simpler to consider or consider only the value of the vertical jump, because there is a high correlation r equals 0.92 between the height of a jump and the peak power calculated from the data of the force platform. So, in other words. In most of these measures, what we've been doing is very basic measures of vertical jump. What Davies and Young were suggesting here is if you actually recorded this data on a force plate, actually what they're finding is because you can measure on a force plate the rate of force development, you can measure time. So if you really wanted to do a vertical jump properly and you were not thinking of this as a field test, then you would use a force platform as you've been perhaps doing in biomechanics. And what they showed was that people who jumped higher doing a normal vertical jump were the people who generated more power through the force plate. And in fact, we can see that here. So this is a, a, a force trace uh, doing a counter movement jump. So what you can see is you can see at the start, you can see the person standing still, which is the quiet stance, which is for about two seconds. And then what they're asked to do is they're asked to go into the counter movement. And so the counter movement is this phase which is referred to as the contact phase. And you can see that the amount of force that they're applying increases as they go into the counter movement. We then get that point which is toe off. So that's that, that vertical line um, which is indicated by TO. That is then where they have taken off from the force plate. So now what we have is how quickly so what we want to measure is, is not how quickly they get back onto the force plate, but actually how quickly they go from the point of the counter movement to the point of takeoff. So the point where we've got the highest amount of force in the contact phase, which you can, you can see, so you can see the highest point in the contact phase, to the point of takeoff. That is the, that is the, the time. And that then can be used to estimate how much power is being produced. So then you've got TIA, which is the time in air. So in this case, it's about half a second. And then what you have is the landing back onto the force plate. Now, if we know, if we know how quickly they generated the force and actually how long they were in the air for, we can actually estimate what the vertical jump was. So this, this is perhaps a more robust way of doing, doing this but this is notwithstanding all the problems we've already referred to, it looks much more scientific. But you've still got to have a participant who is able to repeat the counter movement. You've also got to have a participant where you make the decision about whether they're doing with arms or without arms. So all of those things come into play. They've got to have vertical displacement rather than having horizontal displacement. So all of the issues referred to with the kind of the, the slightly less robust me me methods of Sargent and, and, and so on and, um, and, and Comey are still in play when you use a force plate. It's just that the force plate gives you that, that, that kind of a little bit of extra dimension which it gives you a time index. 
So you can, you can in essence take a, a measure of vertical power or anaerobic power, sorry, from a, from a force place by using some quite simple formulas which are based in the, in the, pre, the, 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 the process of physics from the place of physics. So you can calculate things like time in air, which is jump height. So jump height equals half gravity uh, over time squared. So we can actually work jump height out very sim simply. You can work out vertical velocity of the center of mass, um, takeoff velocity squared divided by two times gravity gives you the jump height, which therefore gives us takeoff velocity. Um, vertical displacement of central mass is jump height, so it's a positive vertical displacement plus the time, uh, the takeoff velocity. So you can get an awful lot from a, from a force plate. And it's great. But I come back to the, the notion, it is still affected in terms of how valid this test is, in terms of, no, sorry, how reliable the test is in terms of what the participant is doing on the force plate. It doesn't matter how precise the instrument is, if the participant cannot repeat that move, manoeuvre, you're not going to have reliable results. And the second question then to ask yourself is, how valid is this? Is it really a valid method of measuring power? Because in essence, I'm doing a jump. And if I'm trying to get to the notion of anaerobic power, how long does it take to reach peak power? Well, actually, we, we, we know, if we go back to kind of our understanding, that we, it takes about one and a half to three seconds to reach the peak ATP turnover rate, particularly in terms of phosphocreatine. So it's not instantaneously, it has a little delay, it has to accelerate off. So he's doing the vertical jump, necessarily the best, best method, because that's quicker than that process. It might give you an indication of the power coming from the, the splitting of an ATP molecule, but even then, we know we have one maximal muscular contraction. Well. In this example here, we're going to a counter movement. There's an awful lot more being involved than just a single splitting of an ATP molecule. So is it valid as well? So here's some data. So what you've got here is some really nice data. So you've got two groups of, of, of individuals where we've got using counter movement, which is C, and non-counter movement, which is NC. And then... We've got it with arms, which is A, and without arms, or no arms, which is N, A. And so what you can start to see are some quite significant effects in terms of the, the data. So what I want you to, 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 to look at is just look at the difference here between the no counter movement. Just look at the no counter movement in terms of the average power. OK, so just look at the average power. So this is the average plus power. So if you notice with no counter movement, irrespective of whether it's arms or no arms, we're in the region of about 1260 watts to 1337 watts. Look at the difference to when you ha have a counter movement. You've gone up from from a, you've gone up to at least 1450 to 1470. There's a big difference there in the amount of power being produced between having counter movement and non counter movement. You can see that when we, we look at, for example, um, the counter movement versus the non counter movement again, but don't worry about whether it's with or without arms, just look at the takeoff velocity. So if you look at the takeoff velocity, you'll notice that the no counter movement is around about 230. 2.30 to 2.53. You can see that the counter movement goes from 2.37 to 2.61. So having a counter movement does affect to a degree the, the takeoff velocity. So we've looked at average power. Now look at the peak power. The peak power goes from about 3,262 in the no, the no counter movement at, at the best to the best of about 3,896 in the counter movement. Big discrepancies. Now look at the effect of arms against no arms. So what I want you to do is just look at the no counter movement because there's less variability in a no counter movement. And look at the average power. The average power between no arms and arms 
here's a big difference. It goes up by nearly, what's that, 100, nearly 100 watts, just under 100 watts. That's quite a big effect. Remember that the watt is your indication of, of, of power. Look at the peak power. The peak power goes up by 600 watts. That's enormous. That's enormous in terms of the, the difference between using arms or no arms. But what I want you to look at is when you go to the um, counter movement, notice the same effect. It's about a 600 watt difference going from arms to no arms. So clearly having the arms has an effect. And so this is why fundamentally one of the things you have to do when you're doing vertical jump testing is you're gonna, if you're going to do it, you have to be consistent. You cannot interchange. Well, yeah, we'll do counter movement today. We'll do, we'll do non-counter movement next time. Or, we, oh, yeah, you can do arms. It doesn't matter. Or you can do an arms. You have to be consistent because it affects quite significantly your estimation of what power is going to be. And in fact, if we look at this data here, which is a really nice way of showing this, is that we can see the test retest reliability of using with and without arm swing. So what you've got here are what are called limits of agreement plots. And limits of agreement are a very, very simple way of taking a group data set. So each data point represents a participant's outcome on a test retest basis. So for each participant, what we have, what they've calculated is the mean jump height, which is on the x-axis across two jumps. And then they've calculated the difference in those jump heights, which is on the y-axis. And so what we are looking for is by plotting the mean difference against the mean jump height, it gives us an indication about how repeatable those, those jumps were. And so for these to show us reliability, the data has to sit as close as possible to what we call the bias line. The bias line is the middle line on the graph. So the bias line is the line that runs through the middle. Notice it's not absolutely on zero. So the bias line is the mean of the differences. So it's the mean of the differences for the whole group. Then what you've got are two other lines, which are the upper and lower lines. And these represent what we call the 95% confidence interval. That refers to basically how much variability there is in the data. And the 95% confidence interval is very simply calculated. It's the standard deviation of the differences multiplied by 1.96. So the bigger that number is, the more variability that we have got. So here, if we take the with arm swing, We've got a bias score, which is just about, just under zero. It's less, it's perhaps 0 0.1. But notice that the coefficient, not the coefficient variation, sorry, the 95% confidence intervals go from positive seven to in this case, actually they go to negative seven. So that is a plus or minus 14 centimeters. That's the important thing. That's a plus or minus 14 centimeters. Now look at the without arm swing. So here we go from plus five to about negative six. That's a plus or minus of 11 centimeters. Still variable because they've probably been doing a counter movement, but less variability. So the repeatability is better without arm swing than it is with arm swing. And you can just see how much more the data sits around the bias score when we don't have an arm swing compared to when we do have an arm swing. So that's a really important lesson in terms of understanding about reliability and how much variance we can see in the data. In terms of normative values, there's actually reasonable sets of, of normative values that are out there. So this is based upon um, uh, percentile rankings and you can see here in males and, and, and females so if you want to know what kind of the average is an average for a male is about 57 centimeters if you're 21 to 25 if you're uh, 26 to 30 um, it's around about what we're we saying here 26 yeah we're looking here at about um, 
55 centimeters. If we go for, for females, around for 50 percent, so the mid the midpoint score is around about 35 up to, a, to around 35.6 centimeters. So you can see the way in which the population is theoretically going to be spread. You have to also understand that normative data is population specific for any test, not just for this, but for any test. So what you want to think about is who am I comparing my participants to? Not only is it got to be reliable and not only is it got to be valid, not only is it got to be specific, when I'm thinking about the data and I'm actually kind of comparing my athlete's outcome, am I comparing it to normative values from a population that represents them? Is it a population of just adults or are they an athlete? Are they a jump athletes? Are they a volleyball player? In which case, I probably need to compare them to volleyball players because they, they, their characteristics will be very different to what you see here in the general population. Here we've got it in terms of um, um, ages. So this is a much younger population groups. And what they've also done here is they've also got this in terms of the power which again is using the, the power estimated by, this will be using from something like the Sayers formula. And again, you can kind of see the 50% rank is anywhere between 21 to uh, 37 centimeters in our young males and 22 to 28 in our young females. And as you can see, as you get into the 95, 95th percentile, that is in the kind of the top 5%, notice, not surprisingly, that the vertical jump heights are much higher and therefore the estimated powers are also much higher. 